making 100 tiny cups is the topic of this week's video. These miniature mugs will be small gifts to be sent out alongside my book, By My Hands, A Potter's Apprenticeship, to competition winners, potters, my team at Penguin, and other people in the industry. Each vessel will be stamped with a limited edition book maker's mark, and each is thrown from 150 grams of a high iron stoneware clay body. I never look forward to preparing this many balls of clay, but they don't need to be weighed out at exactly 150 grams. And for a lump of clay this size, I allow a leeway of plus or minus five, which helps to speed the process up. Each piece is then squashed down and rolled, flipped onto its end, and then slapped down and rolled again. This brings all the measured out pieces of clay together and makes it into a more uniform lump. So it's free of any pockets of air and is completely even in texture throughout. All of these are then transferred onto a plastic line board, which I can spray with water and wrap up as I'm throwing. This way, the balls of clay don't dry out as I work throughout the day. I really try and use a minimal tool set when throwing, especially with a simple shape like these. I use a flat metal scraper to shape the walls, a sponge of some description to soak the water out from inside the pot, a pointed trimmer to remove the skirt of clay from around the bottom of the cup, then there's a chamois leather to soften and even out the rim, and finally a wire which is slid underneath the pot to separate it from the wheel. Each is then thrown with the height and width measured by the throwing gauge you can see on the right. This tool means I don't have to stop the wheel in order to measure the pot. Instead, I just pull the walls up until the rim sits just beside the rubber pointer. And by doing the same for every pot, I'll know they're all the exact same height, which makes my throwing quicker and much more efficient. The leftover skim of clay makes a wonderful sticky surface for the next lump of clay to be thrown against. It's then centered. And as it's such a small lump, I'm using the palm of my left hand rather than my fingertips to do a majority of the shaping. The throwing gauge's pointer is then flicked down and a shallow well is opened up in the center of the lump of clay and stretched out with a depth of about three or four millimeters left in the very bottom to form the base. The walls are then pinched and pulled up in a number of lifts, thinning them and making them taller as the clay walls are essentially extruded upward through a gap between my fingers on the outside and those on the inside. Throughout this process, it's imperative that you keep your hands wet, as well as the walls of the pot, as you don't want either component sticking to the other. Instead, the material should flow through your fingertips as your digits guide the pot into the right place. With the correct height and width achieved, I can move on to tidying the vessel up. This begins with scraping away the excess clay from around the base, and then any excess water or slip inside the pot is removed. I then take my flat metal scraper and position it so it's just skimming the walls, which are then pushed out from the inside against that metal edge. And as my throwing gauge's pointer is made of rubber, it doesn't matter if it collides with the vessel as it tends to just skitter and bounce off it. The rim is then softened with the chamois leather, and then I use a twisted metal wire that's held taut and slid underneath the pot to separate it from the metal wheel head. I then scrape off any excess slip from my hands, carefully cup them around the cup, and then lift as I twist the wheel. There's a bit of a knack to this, but I've made a whole video dedicated to it, a link to which you can see on the screen now, as well as in the description for this video. The wearboards full of thrown pots are then lifted up and moved away. I'm often asked whether I actually enjoy repetition throwing like this, and the short answer is yes. At this stage, I don't look at each pot as being an individual. Instead, all these cups are one, a single body of work, and I find immense satisfaction from letting my hands take over and throwing the pots from muscle memory as my mind is absorbed in the audiobook or podcast I'm listening to, not to mention the gratifying feeling I get from seeing all the pots lined up afterwards. Spin. Giro. Spin. Before I head home for the day, I'll flip as many of the cups over as possible, provided their rims have dried out enough so they aren't distorted by this. 
the weather was still relatively warm when I made these, and as they are quite small objects, if left out uncovered overnight, they could dry out too much, to the point where they're quite difficult to trim or attach handles to, so I'd rather be safe than sorry and cover them up properly. This way I have total control over how they dry and it means I can catch them at the optimal moments for trimming and handling. The following morning I uncover all the cups and once again flip those that have hardened up enough onto their rims. It's worth noting that whilst all this drying out is happening, I'm doing other jobs like throwing new pots and trimming others. I'm not just sitting idly waiting for these to dry, instead I'm juggling two or three batches of work finishing one whilst the other dries, and so on. At about 6pm on a Friday, and all the cups are still slightly too soft to trim, so I place them all on a plastic lined sheet and tightly wrap them up again to survive two days without drying out too much. And I know this footage of wrapping and unwrapping the pots isn't particularly interesting, but it shows the reality of being a potter and how we very carefully halt the drying process of our pots and keep an eagle eye on them so they don't firm up too much and run away from us, which is something that can happen and potentially throw a whole day's work down the drain. It's now Monday, the following week, and the cups are finally the perfect condition to be turned. And I'll be turning these cups on a clay chuck, which is kept wrapped up in plastic and stored in an airtight box to keep them leather hard. Some of these are now more than two years old, and with regular soaking in water, they should stay like this for the foreseeable future. I like leather hard chucks, as the leather hard cups seem to stick to them better, helping to hold them more securely in place. And these are the book stamps I've made, which are going to be pressed into the base of the pot alongside my usual maker's mark. I made four of them as I wasn't sure which might work best, and before using them on the cups, I first tested them on a slab of leather hard clay. I really like the boxed in version, although it may be too large to go next to my normal maker's mark, I don't want it to overpower it, so I think in this case I'll go with the smallest of them. I attach the chuck onto the wheel by brushing some slip over its base and then tap centre it, and it's on top of this that I'll trim the cups. The tapering walls fit snugly within the vessel, holding it tightly and keeping the rim nice and round. When you're repetition making, like this. A chuck can really help speed up the trimming process, as once centred in place I can trim the entirety of the walls and the base in one go. A spinner is placed on top through which I can apply downward pressure to help keep this cup in place. There's a ball bearing between the two components, so they spin independently, which means my fingers which press down on the tool remain stationary, without anything spinning or rubbing against them, which helps to keep everything just that bit more stable. I then use a sharp tungsten carbide turning tool to trim the walls of the pot, thinning them and lightening the vessel whilst refining the shape, making the walls nice and crisp. I then switch to the metal scraper to smooth over the more prominent turning marks, and as the length of the tool covers the entire length of the cup, I use it almost as a guide to make sure the cup has straight walls from top to bottom. The bottom edge is beveled and then the base of the pot is given a very light trim to turn away the lines that were left over from when the pot was wired off. I then burnish the clay smooth with a plastic kidney, compressing the coarse grains of grog back into the clay body. The bottom of the cup will ultimately be the only part of the piece that remains unglazed, so a lot of care and attention is spent on it compared to the walls or the interior of the pot as those parts will be hidden by glaze. The last step for the moment is to stamp the base with the two marks. I then press the cup down and spin the chuck, just to make sure the rim is perfectly round. That's four down, 96 left to go. Once trimmed, I wrap these up as I need them to remain on the firm side of leather hard when the handles are attached. If they dry out too much, the likelihood of my handles cracking around the joints after they've been attached and pulled is much greater. And if I were to leave these out whilst I trim the rest, they'd likely dry out too much. I place a new board down and line it with plastic sheeting. This way the upturned rims don't dry out too much as the absorbent wood will draw moisture out of them and I use kiln props to close the ends. After finishing a few hours later, the chuck can be sliced off 
drenched in water and then wrapped up tightly in plastic. Now I can move on to making the handles for these cups, which begins by preparing more boards with plastic, as the freshly handled cups will be placed onto this so they can be wrapped up again later. The handle pulling process begins with some freshly cut bits of clay, which I pat into a sort of droplet shape with rounded ends and a rolled smooth profile. It doesn't need to be perfect and the clay neither too firm nor too soft. And over a basin of water, I wet this piece of clay and begin stretching it out, squeezing with my thumb and fingers near the top of the piece of clay and pulling it down. Just like when pulling up the walls of a pot, it's imperative that you keep your hand and the length of clay wet during this process. As if your hand sticks to the length, it's very easy to simply tear the whole thing away. Once the strap of clay has my desired shape, I move over to the wear board on my right and snip off individual lengths against the sharp edge of the wooden board. We'll call these blanks. And as I have 100 cups to handle, I'm going to need 100 of these, plus a few more in case I ruin any along the way. At this stage, the blanks can touch, they can have fingerprints, but the lengths themselves need to be as smooth and consistent as you can make them. Essentially, what I'm doing is extruding the clay through an ever-changing die, which is my hand. This means that in theory, you can just use an extruder for this process. Pulling them by hand is a whole skill in itself though, and it's one which means you aren't reliant on a piece of equipment and you can easily change the shape and size of your die plate just by altering the shape of your pulling hand. And it means that if I'm pulling a whole variety of handles of different shapes and sizes in a single session, I'm not having to empty the extruder in order to change the die plate each time, nor do I have any machine to clean up at all, and I can alter the shape and size of my handle blanks at my whim. It's also simply the method I was taught and have practiced for the last 10 years. So it's come to be the method I favor, but in no way does that mean it's the only way to make handles. And really that's one of the very best things about ceramics is there's simply so many ways of doing the same thing. To keep these handle blanks from drying out too much, I'll store them on a plastic lime bat that'll be wrapped up and sprayed with water occasionally throughout the day. As ideally, I want them to remain as soft as they were once freshly pulled. I don't let them dry before attaching them to the cups and pulling them, as if the blanks do firm up too much, they can be harder to blend into the cups, and simply pulling them becomes more of a slog, as the hard clay is more difficult to stretch and manoeuvre. I begin by scoring a small patch about a centimetre or so below the rim. This spot is then covered in slip, dabbed over, not brushed, so it fills the scratches, rather than smoothing them over. I then take a blank, hold it firmly, but not enough to indent the length, and then tap one end that protrudes from my grip so that some of the material flares out all the way around, leaving me with a shape that looks like this. I place the fingers of my left hand opposite the area the blank is going to be pushed against. This braces the wall as the clay is pushed firmly against that scored and slipped patch. And then I carefully compress the length like so to even it out so it isn't so thick. That flare of clay can then be easily blended into the body without having to remove material from the length itself or adding an additional coil of clay around the join, which is something often done. I smooth it all the way around to create a very strong join, as if this isn't done sufficiently enough, the handle blank can just be torn off the cup during this next step. As I work, I continually dip my hand in the basin of water below and I stretch the length, pinching towards the top of the join and gradually drag the material down. You'll notice that I change the position of my hand every few pulls. This way its cross section remains even, as if you were to pull it from only one orientation, you might end up with a lopsided shape. For the last few pulls, I use the tip of my thumb to score three lines in the back of the handle. This thins it out further and removes some of the excess slip and water covering it, leaving a drier length of clay that should hold its shape better. I then take the end of the handle and let it swoop down towards the base, whereupon I use my thumb to press the excess into the foot and then I snip away any excess clay. I then very firmly push the excess material left at the bottom of the handle into the cup, smearing it either side to create a strong join. By attaching it so low on the cup, I have smeared some unwanted clay onto the foot of the cup, but I'll easily be able to tidy that up later. 
For now, the only touching up I do is use a wetted finger just to smooth over the very bottom of the handle. That's three down, 97 left to go. It helps to work quickly when pulling handles. If you spend too much time thinning out the length, you can very easily oversaturate the clay with water, weakening it, which means once looped towards the base and attached, the handle might struggle to keep its shape. Now, as I'm joining wet clay to leather hard clay, I have to make sure these dry out in a very specific way. And that begins by actually making them wetter than they were. So they're sprayed with water and then wrapped up tightly. And I'll leave them like this in their own little humid environment for a couple of days. This way, the soft clay of the handle and the leather hard cup will acclimatize to each other and become the same level of firmness. And only once that's happened, can I unwrap them and dry them a bit more quickly. If instead I left the freshly pulled handles exposed in the open air overnight, it's very likely that a crack would form around the top and bottom joints, as the two parts would continue to dry out at different rates, meaning they're shrinking at different rates. A few hours later, and that's all the cups handled. I'll now leave all of these wrapped up tightly for a number of days, and then I'll unwrap them, sling some plastic loosely over them, and then let them continue drying out to bone dry, whereupon they can be packed into my electric kiln for a bisque firing to 1000 degrees Celsius. Ah, but there is one last step, and that's a final bit of quality control and I have to clean the bases of any of these that may have had some additional smeared clay spread onto the foot. There's also the chance that during the handling process, the base gets scratched or picks up a few burrs of clay as it's moved around on the workbench. Here's how that smeared clay might look, ruining the beveled edge that encircles the base. So each cup is placed back onto the chuck, they're then roughly tap centered and the beveled section is very lightly turned. I then use the plastic kidney to go over the base one last time, whilst being extra careful to not smudge the two marks pressed into the clay. And that's one cup finished. And here's how the base looks after this very quick quality control. I then place the cups base down very gently onto a wooden wearboard, and from this point I won't move them or drag them or do anything until they're bone dry, as the leather hard clay at this stage is still relatively easy to mark, and if I kept moving them around to check their bases or feel their handles, I might inevitably damage the bottom of one. So I just leave them undisturbed, loosely covered with plastic, until they're bone dry like this. This is my Rhoda TE200. It has an internal capacity of 200 litres, which is about seven cubic foot, and all the pots can be packed tightly into this kiln, piled up and touching as densely as possible, as this makes each firing more cost efficient. I can program this kiln to fire automatically overnight, rising in temperature gradually to 985 degrees, whereupon it will sit and soak for 15 minutes, maintaining that temperature. During this firing, clay turns into ceramic. The body hardens, shrinks, and many of the particles fuse together, creating a material that's porous and can no longer be recycled by being soaked in water. It's an irreversible change, during which excess moisture leaves the kiln, as does some organic matter that burns away as gas, which is why you need a hole in the kiln for these fumes to escape through. The program is then set, and what's essentially a giant toaster with a lid will then heat up very slowly overnight. 36 hours later, once the kiln has cooled down enough, it can be opened up and unpacked. You can see the change in colour. The pots also sound different as they're clanked together. They can also be picked up and moved around relatively roughly in comparison to how they were previously when bone dry. In that state, they're exceedingly fragile and must be packed into the kiln very carefully, as it's easier than I'd like to admit to chip the base or the rim of a pot, simply by placing it down a bit too forcefully. All the cups are then moved back over to the wheel so that I can wax their bases. 
Glazes are made up from numerous raw materials mixed with water. When the pots are dipped into the glaze, the water gets absorbed into the clay body, leaving a layer of the larger particles, the raw materials that make up the glaze, on the outside of the pot. So, by waxing the bottoms, I create a barrier the water can't penetrate, meaning that no glaze will adhere to the bottom of the pot, which is important as if the bottoms were glazed, they'd simply stick and fuse to the kiln shelves as they're fired. I'm using a simple wax emulsion for this process, which I water down slightly so it brushes on more smoothly. The piece is tap scented, the wax heaped on, and I always dab some extra into the marks to make sure they're properly sealed. With that done, I'll separate them into four equal groups, as I'll be coating these with four different glazes, although three of them are more or less the same. They just vary by one or two percent red iron oxide, which changes them from either white, such as what's in this bucket, to a deep dark green once fired. The water and raw materials separate with time, so before the glaze is used, it first has to be mixed very thoroughly. I then clasp the pot with a pair of tongs, dip it into the glaze and keep it submerged for four or five seconds. Each is then carefully set onto the wearboard and I move on to the next. This is a white felspathic crackle glaze. It needs to coat the pot in a relatively thick layer. If it's too thin when it goes on, I end up with a glaze that isn't very interesting. And if it coats the pot too thickly, the glaze can begin flaking off before or even during the firing. One of the best things about working with three glazes, where the only thing that changes between them is the colorant, is that I don't have to clean any of my tools when I move to the next color. It's for this reason that I always start with the white, then move on to the pale green, which is colored by 1% red iron oxide, and then onto the dark green, which is colored by 2% red iron oxide. It obviously wouldn't work if I went the other way around, as I'd contaminate the white with iron, which would lead to it firing to a very pale green, as opposed to the gray white I'm after. You can see how the wax prevents the glaze from adhering to the base, although normally it flows from the base onto the walls. So I hold the pot aloft and keep it moving, this way the extra glaze settles evenly on the walls of the cup. The fourth glaze I'm using is this blue Nuka. This is applied in a much thinner layer and should fire to a watery blue that fades to grey on the sharper edges of the cup. And yes, this bucket is a bit too small and I don't quite have enough glaze, but tipping the bucket to one side just about makes it doable. And with all the glazing done, I'll leave these pots out overnight to dry, as the glazed surfaces are quite tacky at the moment, and attempting to clean over the tongue marks or any other stray drips may only make the surface worse. Yet, as the moisture leaves them, the surface becomes powdery and soft, which makes all four of the glazes easier to clean up. For this task, I use a small paring knife to fettle over the drips to make a flush, smooth surface. The tongue marks I simply rub over with a fingertip, and the glaze dust that comes off fills these holes up, and like I always say, the neater the glaze at this point, the better it's going to look once fired. Once all the glaze parts have been cleaned up, I move on to sponging over the base with a sponge, to get rid of any small specks of glaze that settle on the wax, and to make sure the line where glaze and clay meet on that beveled edge is really crisp all the way around, with no uneven or wavering sections. I work over a basin of water that catches much of the glaze dust, and eventually, once I've collected enough, I can sieve it back into the larger buckets of glaze, which means nothing that's removed is wasted. Even the stuff that's sponged away is rinsed out in the water, and with a clean base and walls, that's one pot finished. This is highly repetitive, careful work, as my hand gripping the pot has to be very steady and not drag on the surface, as it's very easy to create thin patches that remain visible even after the pot has been fired. Up close like this, you can really see the stray drips and dots that I have to remove, and whilst the tiny pinpricks aren't much of a concern, 
Anywhere the glaze protrudes out too much is carved away to make the surface flush. And a small scrap of sponge is used to tidy the base up. I even salvage glaze from the wearboards. I wipe them clean before placing the freshly glazed pots on them. This way, afterwards, I can simply scrape all the glaze off them and wash the rest off with a clean wet sponge, wetting both sides as they tend to warp less. It took about three hours to get through all of these cups, and with that I can begin to pack them into my gas kiln to be reduction fired. The good thing about pots this small is that they can easily be placed into those spots in the kiln that might otherwise go unused, filling those awkward spots of negative space between the larger pots. For this firing, the pots cannot touch. I leave about two millimeters between each, as if they do touch, the glass covering each of them will melt and fuse together, which inevitably means the two pots need to be snapped to separate them. Once again, my aim is to pack this kiln as densely as I can, using as little unused space as possible. Not only does this make each firing more cost effective, but it makes achieving a good, strong reduction atmosphere easier, as there's simply less space for oxygen to take up. If I left large gaping spaces in this kiln and tried to fire it in reduction, I'd have a very difficult time achieving a proper reduced atmosphere inside the kiln, meaning the surfaces of my pots wouldn't fire to the right colour. And you can see how these mini mugs, or espresso cups, squeeze in nicely between the bigger pots on the top layer. And that's the kiln full. At 7am the following morning, the kiln is lit. This kiln, instead of being fired electrically, is fueled with natural gas, and it's this that makes achieving a reduction atmosphere possible. Each of the four burners are lit, and the door is swung closed and sealed tight. The firing itself lasts about 8 hours, from start to finish, with an end temperature of approximately 1290 degrees Celsius. For the first three or four hundred degrees, I increase the temperature very gradually to slowly drive off any moisture left in the glazed pots. As if you rush this beginning section and the moisture turns to steam instantly, this can cause pots inside to explode. As I fire the kiln, I keep notes on practically everything, and I'll make a note if I change the gas pressure, the air pressure, or change the position of the dampers. And every 30 minutes I jot down the temperature and the hour make a note of any changes and jot the position on the graph to see if the firing is going as planned. The large slab you can see here to the left of the holes is the damper that covers the flues of the kiln, and at 860 degrees precisely I increase the gas and air pressure and slide the damper so it covers about half of the holes. It's this which initiates the reduction atmosphere, as very quickly the chamber fills up with too much gas as the damper covering the flues limits how quickly the exhaust can escape the kiln. Inside, there simply isn't enough oxygen for all the gas to burn efficiently, and as a result, the burning atmosphere inside begins to strip away oxygen from inside the clay and glazes themselves, thus creating colours and surfaces that are only achievable with a gas kiln. As the temperature reaches its climax, I periodically nudge the damper open just a little bit, as otherwise the temperature can stall, ceasing to rise. The flames you see protruding from the flues and through the spy holes in the door is the internal atmosphere trying to find oxygen, to the point where the flames begin to project from the fiery chamber. And once cone 10 is fully bent over, the kiln can be switched off and I quickly crash cool it back down to 1000 degrees Celsius. This helps the glazes to retain their colour and keeps the surfaces nice and glossy. Once 1000 degrees is reached, I fully seal the kiln back up and let it cool down for another 36 hours or so, upon which the doors can be cracked open and the now even more shrunken pots revealed. From freshly thrown to this point, the clay shrinks about 
This means that whilst at the beginning the cups may have been too big for an espresso cup, they're now a much more appropriate size. From this point, with the door swung open, I'll let the kiln cool naturally for another 30 or 40 minutes, as most of the pots are still far too hot to touch. And here you can see the pale green top middle with the dark green just below it, and two blue nuka cups to the right. The next step in this long process is an exciting one, as I get to unpack the pots and look at them properly. And here's five of those 100 espresso cups. The blue nuka is more blue than I remember it. Here's the pale green that breaks to a lovely warmer tone on the rim. The blue, which is thinner, shows more of the anatomy of the pot underneath. And here's the white that sits more flatly on these shapes, as it doesn't contain any iron as a flux, meaning it tends to look a bit more static. The actual final step for these is to sand their bases, as even though I spent so much time burnishing the clay, as these pots fire, the clay ends up shrinking more than the grog the body contains, meaning all the coarse particles I spent time compressing are now suddenly present again, meaning the bottoms of them are relatively rough and I give each one a quick sand with this Diamond Core Tools 200 grit diamond pad just to take the edge off. But I don't want to grind away too much as it's very easy to remove the surface level of color given to the pots via the reduction firing process. This is the toasted look they have, although the orange color you can see closer to the glaze is caused by soluble salts found in the feldspar in the glaze. These volatilize during the firing, discoloring the clay nearby. been a long road, but these pots are now finally finished. There's an extraordinary amount of repetition that goes into producing this many cups. Sometimes it's enjoyable work, like the throwing and trimming, yet tasks like tidying up the glaze certainly feel more monotonous, but they must be done well. And the sheer satisfaction that comes from seeing all of them finished, like this, is well worth the dozens of hours that went into creating these. Here's a before and after of how the pots look when freshly glazed versus how they appear once reduction fired. And now all that's left is to wrap them up and send them off. And these went to people all over the world, packed up with recyclable materials, padded and protected to survive their long journeys ahead. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video if you've made it all the way to the end. As always, it's good to hear from those of you who do. I'll leave you with this pot being wrapped and as always, I'll see you next time.